My name is Manuel Schenkhuizen. Uh, you are here in my home in the Netherlands. I was lost. Welcome to our humble establishment. Hello, welcome. This is our hallway, and uh, this is where we lock all the noobs. Uh, no, it's, it's just where we store um, all the uh, summer clothes and storage. And uh, noobs. Okay. <laughs> Come in. I'm uh, 22 years old. And for a living, I play Warcraft 3, The Frozen Throne, since about six, seven years. Uh, I play the race Orc. This is uh, pretty much our living room, where we, uh, where we relax if we're not uh, gaming. Here's our, our movies. Of course, uh, unmissable in a, a geek house. Well, it's not a geek house, but unmissable for us anyway. Lord of the Rings extended version. <laughs> if I would have to describe myself, I would say I'm a down-to-earth, calm guy who uh, likes to have fun and who likes to choose his own path in life and who realizes that uh, you should live without regrets uh, and just do what you love doing. Fireplace, which gives warmth in two ways, atmosphere and uh, Actual temperature. It's uh, extendable for those uh, large uh, family parties. We had one uh, last Christmas where, for the first time, not in our parents' home, but uh, you know, my brothers and uh, my parents and some friends came and uh, we had a Christmas uh, dinner, which was very nice. What I don't like about myself, well, I guess I can be a bit forgetful at times. Uh, overall, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied about myself though. <laughs> Basically, I try to categorize it a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, fantasy and fiction, uh, science fiction, mostly in this part on the right. We've got some uh, gaming magazines, which uh, we got from friends uh, who did an interview with us or what have you. And here on the left, we got a little bit of horror. Um, well, or as far as that exists in books. Uh, this is the historical books, Olympus and Seven Ancient Wonders and so on. And uh, we've got some self, like self-help books about love or constructing your home or dictionaries. That's uh, as far as books goes. Uh, it's always hard to say what people like about you, but uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm an honest guy and uh, who tries not to have his judgment ready and I try to accept everyone the way they are. Uh, yeah, so I think people can feel comfortable with me. I hope so at least. Service from all over the world. China, Korea, uh, souvenirs from different countries. This one is from uh, Malaysia. <laughs> so we have quite a large variety. And this is from Korea which all the Korean fans who certainly will be watching this uh, should recognize. What do I do when I don't play Warcraft 3? Well, uh, I would either be taking out the trash, doing the dishes or eating. I think that's pretty much the list of things uh, what I do when I don't play Warcraft 3. Which is uh, one very important part of uh, growing up as a pro gamer, doing the dishes. I grew up in uh, Nieuwegein, which is a, a beautiful city. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you know, it's the city where I grew up in, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm proud about that. It's, uh, it's not very big, maybe, well, I don't know, but I think we have like, well, maybe more than 10,000 inhabitants. Pretty close to Utrecht. And I, I pretty much lived here all my life. And recently, I, like uh, four or five months ago, I moved out and got my own place here, which which is pretty close to my, uh, my parents' house. And you know, maybe I would have chosen to live somewhere else, but I, I like to live close to my family because uh, when I'm traveling so much and have a pretty demanding job, I don't get to spend that much time with my family sometimes. So uh, I fear that if I were living somewhere else, I wouldn't see them at all. Uh, so we all live, well, most of us live pretty close to each other. And uh, so we can visit each other. This is our garden. And we have a shed and 
you know, we're trying to grow some plants if you want to see tulips and so on. Uh, we planted the uh, tulips like... Uh, last November? Yeah, no, last November. Uh, December even. Yeah. Pushing it. I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And they're doing nicely? Yeah, they're growing up. I have three brothers. Uh, they're all older than me, but I'm the tallest. <laughs> uh, uh, they're, they're Taco, Arthur and Yorit in uh, ascending order of age. Uh, they're two, six and eight years older than me and uh, I always consider myself pretty lucky to have three brothers and uh, we get along very well. They are not so much the bullying old brothers and I'm not so much the annoying little brother. I think we, we all had our, uh, of course we had our fights, but I think overall we always had a very good time together. It's not much, but uh, I mean, for a great cook like Cassandra, she should deserve a bigger kitchen. But uh, you know, this is uh, actually a, a construction by one of the previous previous owners. They changed a lot about this house, which makes it kind of a yeah a unique house. Um, all the other houses down the street there, you know, they kind of fit the standard framework. And there were a lot of constructions here. Like this used to be outside. Uh, they chose to have a somewhat smaller kitchen. We have electrical cooking. We prefer fire, but uh, you know, we, we're getting used to it. Well, um, as I said, uh, I have a very demanding uh, job and uh, that means that I have to spend a lot of time into that. So uh, whenever we get a little bit of time off to relax, we like to enjoy it to watch a movie um, yeah, or, or go out into the city together. But most of the time, we're usually spending on on uh, our jobs. Uh, recently, Cassandra also became like um, my manager for for the team. And if you see how much work she's had on that, uh, <coughs> I think you wouldn't believe it. Uh, we we work together at events. To uh, she does the pictures and the reporting, and uh, I do the playing. And in the end, we just try to form a team in pretty much in anything we do, whether it is to have fun or to work our jobs and just to the way we spend our lives together is uh, we always do it side by side. This is the first floor, although I like to call it the second floor. I don't agree with the normal naming conventions. For me, ground level is the first floor and this is second. So welcome to our second floor. It's our house so we can call it whatever we want. Manuel's family is really nice. Um, because when I first came to live in Netherlands, they already accepted me as part of their family. And uh, in, in our first month here, we already went um, for a vacation together uh, to Grand Canaria, like with the whole family. And uh, I really appreciate that uh, Marielle's mom uh, allowed me to stay in, in her house uh, when we didn't buy our own house yet. Uh, so she supported us for a year and a half or, or more. So I, I really appreciate that uh, she could support us like this. I think Cassandra had to sacrifice a lot for us to be able to have this life um, because you know, she, she grew up in, uh, in Singapore and I grew up in Netherlands and uh, I can't go to Singapore because I wouldn't be able to do my job. The, the ping would be too bad. Uh, so she had to abandon that cute little island with the great weather and the great food for, uh, for Netherlands, which I think is uh, comparatively in the world, which is a very fine country, but uh, uh, Singapore is pretty special. And yeah, we, I guess we all make sacrifice for what we do, but if it's worth it in the end, then I still think you can consider yourself uh, lucky. I come from a very small island, uh, which is Singapore, but I, I think Singapore is one of the most modern cities in the world. And I'm very comfortable living in Singapore and, and I still miss the place. I come to Europe because of my boyfriend, um, just so that I could be with him all the time. So we don't live in different countries because I don't think it will ever work out. Like, Two person living in different countries, trying to have a relationship and only meeting up once in a while, you know. I like games that are not too easy. 
they don't have like a perfect high score so no racing or sports for me i like games that you can put something of yourself in basically like i need i i want to feel like when i play a game i'm doing something which no one ever thought of before i want to be a pioneer into this uncharted territory and be an explorer like columbus except in the game uh, uh, if i'm playing the game and it's very linear and i feel like okay everyone who plays this game is playing it just like i am i don't feel like it's special enough an rts everyone plays it differently so that's already good for me uh, rpg if the options are big enough to customize your character that's also very good for me uh, so i like games that are challenging complex um, fun and maybe reasonably fast paced there must be some kind of combat and magic and it needs to be it needs to be not too linear yeah there's the tram the tram uh, that we like to take uh, to get to the airport except other direction very conveniently located next to our house so we don't have to uh, carry our luggage very far anymore our bed clothing cupboard nothing you haven't seen before but that's that's ours and I said before that uh, I wasn't the annoying little brother, right? But I'm not sure if that's just wishful thinking on my part. Um, we... Look, when you're the youngest, I think, with three older brothers, they're gonna be older than you. No, you can't change that. Uh, they're gonna be probably better at everything that you do. Um, like games and sports, they're gonna be better, they're gonna be faster. There were times where I thought I could outrun my eight-year-old, um, <clears throat> my brother who's eight years older than me, but I think he was just letting me win. Uh, when I won against my brother in chess, he was just letting me win. When he was uh, younger, he could be uh, pretty uh, uh, aggressive, isn't the right word, but uh, uh, when he had a balloon, uh, he always tried to slap us with it. But if he found like a hammer or something, he tried to do the same because we thought we were his oldest brothers. So uh, we, we couldn't get hurt, and, but he didn't know the difference what was, uh, that we felt when he hits us with a hammer or with a balloon. So it was uh, sometimes when he had the wrong item in his hand, we had to run very hard, even when he was very little, because he, he didn't understand the difference. So that was pretty funny. We didn't physically fight a lot, but uh, if we did, I always thought that my brothers, because they're older, they can't feel pain. So uh, if they, maybe they push me around a little or, or tickle me or pinch me, but uh, I used to employ weapons uh, of mass destruction, like uh, you know, hit them with toy swords or just throw it at them. And if I got uh, angry or maybe they deserved it, uh, uh, sometimes it was pretty bad. <laughs> I hit them quite hard. When we were uh, uh, younger, we only had one computer or we had two, but one was for my dad, so we couldn't play on it. So we had to share it because uh, we all liked the computer very much. So uh, because my mom didn't want to have, uh, we had fights about it. She said, uh, okay, you share, uh, you an hour, you an hour, so we could uh, share. We always tried to uh, uh, make your share bigger, uh, just to say, I want to finish this game or I want to finish that game. If you're actually going to fight for it, None of you are gonna play. You're gonna lie on the floor with a rough and tumble. And no one is gonna play the computer, and that would be a big waste. Uh, so we have this rule t in order to keep it civilized. Whomever on a day presses the button on the PC first, he gets he like re reserves a time frame where he can use the the PC. So that makes it so that as long as you're the first to press the button. Uh, you get to play the first hour or two hours and, and then uh, the other brother could, could say, you know, hey, could you maybe consider in the future the possibility that my person could use the PC if you feel like maybe you've played enough? Uh, you know, that's, that's the intro, you gotta be careful because if you piss off the one who's using the PC, you know, can say bye bye uh, and then half an hour later you come back to so how do you feel about you know the chances of me perhaps later today using the pc and then uh, at some point 
the rules of warfare have to be considered and the, the one who's using the PC must be diplomatic and say, okay, uh, maybe in an hour. So you come back in 45 minutes and say, you know, it's been an hour, uh, can, can I use the PC now? And then, oh, then the other will be like, you know, I'm, I can't save it right now, so uh, I'm in the middle of a game, but maybe come back a little later and then sometimes you'll watch and enjoy watching the other play. And then, okay, eventually you can use the PC. And we just try to uh, be as nice as possible towards each other and share the time we use uh, the PC. We all understood that when you play a game, you want to finish it before you, uh, uh, bef before you stop. So uh, when you know it's almost your time, you just start a new game, so you, already, you have already uh, uh, another 15 minutes before it's finished. So it was always uh, a struggle, but in a nice way. One thing is like, okay, the one who presses the button first can use the PC first. This was a pretty important point because when we were in primary school, my youngest brother and me, we always finish school at the same time and we live in the same house. So you've got to find ways how you can make the journey from school to home the fastest. So uh, it was always a big question. Do you take the bike or do you run? You know, if you run, you... Uh, you are more flexible, you have higher acceleration speeds at the, at the traffic lights, you know, it takes longer to fire up a bike, you don't have to unlock your bike at the school and you don't have to put it in the shed. These are all advantages that you have when you run. But the bike is faster across the straight stretches, right? So uh, it pretty much varied sometimes, like do you think it's gonna be hard to pike, park your bike in a good place where you can get like the fastest takeoff speed? And then eventually, you, you'll see uh, we would reach home pretty much at the same time so it's like a lot of uh, slapping the other's hand away when he's putting the key in the lock and or you let him open the door and then you try to floor him and, and enter the enter the house uh, after some time uh, Manuel got better in uh, in Warcraft and then uh, sometimes it was nicer to watch his games when he played a uh, fierce competition than uh, we played ourselves so sometimes we said okay you play uh, we watch uh, and then uh, uh, even sometimes when the computer was on my room, I said, okay, I go to sleep, but you can still play. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, at the end it uh, worked out well. Welcome to the third floor. We do three things here. We work and we'll show you that later. First, we'll show you the, I would say, kind of like the household room for Part one, ironing. Part two, doing the laundry. And uh, part three, storing uh, the checks, which uh, we haven't found a place for yet. But uh, here they are. There are, I guess, quite quite a few. Originally, we thought we'll wallpaper the, our new room with it, but uh, I don't think that's very nice. The things my parents said to me when I played Wii, or I played computer all the time, it was stuff like, uh, well, shouldn't you be doing your homework? And then, of course, I'll be like a typical puberty kid. Well, my grades are okay, so uh, why, why should I? No, you have to do homework. Yeah, but I already done it. Of, of course, I always want, uh, or I, I don't understand um, that it was so fun. And I think it's very st uh, static, right? uh, playing all the time on the PC. And uh, I told you before, that's, he has, uh, I like that he goes outside. When I was more little, like before middle school, like in primary school, uh, there was, well, then they still had like the, the power over, over the kid to actually say, okay, now you have to go out. Of course, I discovered that uh, the children want, the youngest two want to go on the, uh, on the computer. They want to game, uh, play on the computer. And for me, because I'm from a different generation, uh, I don't see the, the lot of fun of it. So there is also uh, often a fight, how many minutes they can play, or they have to divide, of course, the one and the other, because there was one PC. And then they, I send them outside, and they, I said, you have to play outside, because it's healthy for you. And then they go outside, because they listen to me at, at that time. And then they are outside and they uh, are standing there for a quarter and then they come back. Can I come in now? I've been outside now. So 
It was unstoppable. <laughs> and then, yeah, sure, I went out and I sit outside on the porch in front of the front door. And then after 10 minutes, I'll be like, can I come in yet? And now I have to go out and play. And, you know, it's sunny. Other kids are playing soccer. And I'm just waiting there half an hour, an hour. Okay, I can go inside. This didn't happen all the time. I actually did as a kid uh, do more other things like uh, I did play a lot of sports, I played the piano for five years. But I understand that um, playing the piano, he was very good in it, he, he did it for a few years. So if he didn't uh, choose for the game, he could be a very famous, I think, <laughs> musician playing uh, the piano. Because his fingers were always very quickly, very fast, eh? that's the better word. <laughs> I played uh, soccer mostly as a defender and goalkeeper. Uh, for about two, three years, and I've done ninjutsu uh, for about two years. But uh, overall, I always loved playing the computer, and uh, I compared like everything else I did. Would I rather be playing a game now, or would I rather be doing this? And yeah, many times I rather did something else, but in the end, if I had some free time, I always loved to play games. And yeah, like any good parent, they would they would say. Uh, you know, don't you spend too much time behind the PC or you should try to go out at least every day for a little bit. And I think that's, you know, that's good advice. Well, here we are uh, to the gaming room on the third floor. Uh, this, is our, uh, this is our place where we spread uh, chaos and destruction uh, over the net. Uh, the pink keyboard is mine and uh, <laughs> the pink keyboard is Cassandra, so she's, she usually sits here and does her uh, managerial duties and uh, whatnot. This is my, uh, my setup, my PC, and uh, you know, where I play from. Um, printer, okay. This is, uh, you know, this is a table we reserve for me to do my notes or Cassandra to do arts and crafts. Sometimes we do our administration. I had studied for all of my memorized life, and I would do so for the next four or five years again. You know, I thought there, there, there should be more to life than this for me. This is something I felt very strongly. And I had no idea what I wanted to do. Like, what do I study? What job do I want? I had no idea. And there was one thing that I really loved doing, which was play Warcraft 3. And I had been doing it for about one or two years. And I had played a few tournaments. And I got one chance to see what I could be like if I put my full devotion to it. I had a two weeks Christmas holiday and after that was the CyberX Games. Now, as you may or may not know, CyberX Games was a big scam. Uh, it was hosted by this guy who eventually ran away with the money uh, with some excuses. It was uh, probably, if I compare it now, a poorly hosted event with lots of technical issues. But for me, it was the first big tournament that I won. Uh, the prize money wasn't paid out, but I mean, that's, an, that, that's nasty, but uh, I still remember the tournament experience fondly and that's something that I wouldn't forget. Um, there were lots of international players and, and I came out on top and, and the reason was I had two full weeks to practice and I thought, okay, maybe I have potential, you know, maybe I can actually win. So I thought, what happens if I take one year off and I, and I go play Warcraft full? Maybe I could make a, yeah, maybe I could make a life out of this. You know? and, uh, and so I, I had to ask my parents for permission. I mean, I'm, you know, you're 18, you're adult, but you're still living at home and you're not really adult just because the, your age changes. I mean, this is something more. And I, I mean, I want to have a good relationship with my parents and they're, they're older and they're wise. And so, you know, but I, I asked them, uh, is it okay that I, that I don't study right away now? Because I know that's what they hope for me. The first time when Manuel goes um, abroad, when he was still at school, yeah, that's uh, different than how it's now, that now it's uh, really his job. Uh, but the first time, of course, I was a little bit worried because I think, is it, um, how is it about his results when he comes back? 
uh, can he uh, have the uh, does he have the uh, the strength to do his work also for the school because I like to for him of course especially for him to get his diploma uh, but the teacher when they say it's okay even with uh, that <laughs> um, yeah I have to um, uh, I have to accept but I, I, I was worried yeah when I think back yeah as a person, of course, we all support him. Uh, I know when he started uh, to tell, uh, to say, I want to be a professional gamer, he, uh, not everybody was very enthusiastic about it because uh, everybody thought, oh, is it well, so why should you go uh, study? Uh, you know the story, about, especially about people who are, uh, don't know the scene or there wasn't even a scene yet. Uh, but uh, uh, so uh, not everybody, not everybody was really enthusiastic about it, but uh, because he really wanted it, we, we supported him after all. So I, I asked, is it okay that I study one year later? And I guess I kind of promised, you know, one year of Warcraft, see what I can do, then I go back to, to study. And, uh, you know, they agreed. They agreed with it and, uh, yeah, I went to play Warcraft and I won my first two world championships. And then I thought, uh, well, I'm not ready with this. I would regret it if I stopped now. And yeah, I guess they they already saw it coming, I guess, uh, that it would be difficult for me to, to stop this, uh, and to go back and study. Uh, I feel like it would be giving up too much. And I just enjoyed this too much. And also, I was successful, so I had the necessary justification that I needed to keep doing what I do. Here are our prize cabinets, the sword, uh, all the trophies that we gathered over the years. And <laughs> some artworks here to, you know, to give us the feel of what we do, put us in the mood. Yeah, and some certificates from ESL. That's a, that's a difficult question. What would I do if they hadn't given their permission? Since it didn't happen, I can never know for sure, right? But, um, like I said, my relationship with my parents is important, so I would have definitely had it very difficult in making a choice. It is possible for me to be influenced quite strongly by, uh, by what someone who's close to me thinks. So if both of them would have been against it, I wonder, maybe I would have gone to study, but I don't think I would have been happy. Now we are in uh, the office, which is uh, the gaming room. So you can see uh, Manuel is playing there. We are getting ready for the clan war, uh, which is starting in 10 minutes. Uh, we are playing against clan SK. I really enjoy watching him play because uh, he's one of the more experienced players. Uh, and he's very creative and he doesn't always play the same uh, which is very important uh, for entertainment. And, and when he's um, playing 100% uh, I don't talk to him or anything, uh, no distractions so I'll, I'll just sit by his side uh, even when something is going wrong, I can't say anything like, oh, hey, watch out, your hero. I, I just, just gotta keep quiet. <laughs> when I was still playing StarCraft, uh, there was this game called Warcraft 3 uh, Reign of Chaos coming out and Taco was already 
he was already playing Warcraft 3 before it was out. Uh, uh, not, not because we like to do uh, pirating, but he just couldn't wait. And when the game came out, we bought two copies of it to, to, make, it, uh, to make up for it. But somehow we didn't really get into it. I, I don't know why, but there was... I remember there was one point where I either... I must have seen someone play, or I saw it in a replay, I think, of this guy, a Night Elf player against Human on the Temple, and he made the, the Keeper of the Grove hero first. And there's this skill called Entangling Roots. He went to the human base and would just entangle a peasant, keep attacking it while the roots are there, and it would actually die. Uh, and it can't run away. And I was like, wow, that's really annoying. You can really piss someone off with that. And uh, he didn't just do it once. I mean, he, he entangles four or five peasants, they're dead. He goes healing and then he does it again. I think that's the first time that I really thought uh, this game is really nice. I do think that I like to, to get into people's heads and if I see that they're annoyed, power to me. That was really when I, when I said, okay, it's been enough of StarCraft now. Uh, I can't wait to get home from school to make that Keeper of the Grove. I think inadvertently through my having fun, I also learned a certain set of skills which you can't learn just by playing solo. Like, the, the feeling of controlling a 100-foot army is quite common in FFA, but very rare in, uh, in solo. But there could just be a case where you could have use of it. And in ESO.NL, it was definitely true that there were uh, players who did some things better than me. So I just tried to learn from them. And uh, eventually, I think, Myth and me, we were playing at a level where we could compete pretty decently with the European top. And it was at that point that uh, Tillerman from Four Kings invited us to, uh, to join Four Kings to play WC3L as a 2v2 team primarily. I think that was the first time I had to choose between what seems to be more professional and the ability to go abroad uh, and stuff uh, and between friends. Because the Four Kings guys uh, they were not really friends. Uh, I mean, Fury was a friend already, but uh, the rest, I was like more scared of them than friendly with them. Like uh, Zeus kind of intimidated me and I was scared of Kai in competition, like Kash, uh, because uh, I saw how he plays and I thought he's like very strong and I was afraid to play against him. And it was this big unknown world, but possibly more professional. I think that was the first time I had to choose between uh, friends and the possibility of more and I thought you know those those friends they can remain my friends but I want to play in the WC3 well, it was just crazy for me and I remember I was staying at my dad's place at that time and um, yeah we were probably playing against SK or another team but I got sick I, I got a fever for my first clan war and Tillerman asked if I could play on such and so date in that time and I thought oh my god no I'm sick you know I have a clan war and I'm sick what am I gonna do and shall I tell him how do I tell him and I was like hey Tillerman I'm sorry I'm ill I don't know if I can play and I felt so awful and guilty and everything and he was just like oh that's okay you know people get sick and I was like what <laughs> he just he's just so cool about it and uh, so I got to play the next week and you know, full confidence and I, I was strong against human as one of the only few orcs. So I thought I could do it. Uh, you know, winning against human on the ladder wasn't the same as winning against human in clan wars. And I remember I lost my first two, three matches. First against Insomnia and then against uh, MTW Jan the Pig. Then maybe more, I don't know. But I didn't have a glorious debut. But as the season went on, I think I also got some wins and I started getting the hang of it and also the pleasure without like the extreme, extreme stress that I thought, oh my God, this is like so important. Uh, this uh, could kill me or save me. You know, I still thought it was very important, but uh, I could relax more and try to play my own game. For ESWC 2003, I had to qualify on a summer day, about 35 degrees Celsius. I was already known as the best player in Netherlands. So everyone was like, ah, let's not go. Grubby's already going and the weather is too good to waste the day. So I went to Rotterdam, uh, the city, and 
got there and they said, you know, no one else showed up, so just stay here for a bit so we can take your picture and then you got yourself a free ticket to Paris. Or I think it was in Poitiers and I met my first South Korean person in general, probably, and also the first South Korean player, who was, uh, which was Dayfly and Showtime. And I especially held Showtime in very high regard uh, because he was just this legend who I saw doing this crazy stuff like never letting his demon hunter die and just having this crazy micro and I thought that he would just ignore me or not look at me or when I say hi he'll be like uh, go away push me on the ground kick me but in fact I uh, I was too too scared to say anything and he came to me and he said hi Grubby and I was like wow he knows my name and he said hi and I was uh you know, I was I was humbled by that. That was my first big tournament. Then you had a lot of like split screen of uh, player views and also observer views. So it was all very, very easy to follow the action wherever you want. And it wasn't just that. There was shoutcast in front uh, in French in the main hall, which was like a cinema. But every visitor got a headset to get a, a translation in English, which I thought was a really nice idea. And I think, was there a heart rate monitor? I think so. Uh, for, for players who play on the stage, and well, I just remember Matt Frog's heart rate went up very high, uh, which probably means he was nervous and, uh, or excited or pumped up adrenaline, which I thought was cool to see. I played Orc for nearly all of my tournaments in my life. Night Elf I played at ESWC 2003. After that I chose to switch to Human because Human is Imba uh, in Reign of Chaos. And I lost to Human at the tournament and uh, I had to change to Human so that I could win the Dutch qualifier for WCG. I don't know if uh, uh, Grubby uh, told you about uh, he once wanted to stop gaming because he uh, played a Dutch qualification uh, game and uh, he lost uh, versus uh, as a psycho. Thank you. Uh, and uh, he, he got in the loser bracket and uh, he didn't. He thought uh, if I lose to him, I never uh, win. And he was uh, very sick of it. And then I told him to play human because I saw in other replays that human was a stronger race at the moment. And he, he played it and he qualified and then he could go to the WCG and then he kept uh, playing Newman. And after some time he switched back to Orc and to Night Elf, uh, but uh, that's what, uh, yeah, it was really nice uh, to get him motivated again uh, with the game. Then I played Newman for two tournaments, European Cyber Games 2003 and World Cyber Games 2003. Ever since after I've played Orc, except one time I played Undead uh, against Totti in the finals of the Chinese story. Pride gets in the way of most people. Uh, for me, it never does. I mean, I enjoy playing with x Wars human. I, if anyone can beat me with their off-race, that means they are a valid practice partner or I'm playing too bad. Uh, pride never gets in the way for me, but a lot of people apparently are like that, uh, which means mostly leather. And uh, it actually came to pass that I was in 2006 in the city of Qingdao in China. Uh, I, I met Tot in the grand finals after uh, beating Suho in a pretty thrilling match. And then against Tot I played Orc and I lost the first match and the second match was Turtle Rock. So I was like, oh God, what should I do? Do I have the nerves to go to go play Undead now? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And for me, that's a very memorable game because it's the only time I ever played Undead online against a uh, top player. And I actually remember I got like footmen around, I mean, doing ghoul surrounds on this footman. And I stole a level 7 turtle uh, with a coil from behind the forest. And, you know, that's not, it, it kind of gives me the feeling of how Anders must feel uh, doing good moves. It's really funny, actually. <laughs> I think I must have laughed a little inside. As a more experienced player and already established, I, I, I like to keep an eye out for up and coming players where I recognize myself in them, kind of. Because I always remember there were, there were a few people when I was growing up as a player who helped me with, without any regard for how they get better from it. 
you could call it uh, altruism. They just help me because they are nice or because they share the knowledge. And uh, you know, such experience can be very valuable and uh, it can mean a lot to me. Like uh, I remember I was asking Taker for, uh, uh, you know, Christopher, for advice against night elves. Like, how do you beat those night elves, man? And he's like, well, I just towered him. And I'm like, wow, that's genius. <laughs> I should do that too. And uh, so I, I try to see up and coming players uh, to see if they have potential. And I, th I think I'm pretty good at recognizing that. Uh, for example, uh, seeing the potential of uh, Creolophus and uh, also Todd got his big boost in Four Kings and uh, you know, Fav, Lil DC. These are all players that you know you see them coming a long time before maybe most of the people think that they're good or before they're known. One of those players was uh, Rotterdam. Uh, he, he started out his claim to fame pretty much when uh, he had a very strong game against Undead. He was uh, playing Farseer and Torrent Chieftain and doing Mass Wyverns. But what was special about his style, he was extremely aggressive. And I don't necessarily mean aggressive at the right time. He was just aggressive, like he's gonna attack you, you can count on that. But a lot of players were not used to playing like, uh, against that style. And he, against Undead, he also combined it with uh, some smarts. Like, um, he also creeps. So he was creeping and harassing, creeping and harassing, and it came to the point where I think a lot of Undead players were calling him a map hacker, which I don't believe is true. Well, I think it started for me the same as it uh, started for um, you know, nearly every other player that got famous in World of 3. Uh, just started to play like a lot of ladder and like a lot you should have to think of, maybe 20 or 25 games uh, a day, if, if I had the time that is. And as soon as you start to play more, you can get higher level. and. When you go back to the days when you were totally unknown and you just start, like uh, a lot of wins mean a lot. And certainly in the moment you f you faced, like and back in the days you had like all good players playing ladder. And uh, you know, th this is how I thought. You know, he is better than me in some ways already, even though he's like this unknown guy. He was playing like with more confidence against Undead. I mean, most orcs are strong against Undead, and so was I. But I could see some things that he did, and I thought. Wow, would I have thought of that or would I have done that? And if you can do that, if you can see that, then you realize that someone has something that you're not then you can learn from him. So when you face like one of the most famous guys and first you will lose all of those games, but every, once in a while you start to take like one map. And even though you lost the previous four games, it doesn't matter because that one time you beat the famous player. So that's the moment you start, you feel like imp you're improving, but still you need more. I have to say most of it was not me teaching him. I just uh, enjoy playing with him and owning him with my off races. Um, yeah. uh, I, I would play against him with Undead to see how I can do with Undead against him. I would play against him with Human and Night Elf and he didn't mind. I was already a better player. Uh, he's getting a chance to play with someone good even if it's not his own race. And eventually I stopped being able to beat him with my other races. As soon as I started to get more uh, contact with the famous Dutch guys was like the time as well uh, where I first started to meet Grubby actually because before that Grubby was just like an idol for me like it's for every orc who's unknown uh, I mean even like back then it sounds silly but even like when speaking to Grubby or something was back then something special because you, you thought that he was like some kind of half god or so so uh, as soon as I started to talk with him and then actually started to play games with him because uh, yeah it would benefit him as well if I would get better uh, for the ENC for our national team because just wants to make the strongest national team possible and that's uh, I think that's when I started to get in touch with Groby and after that I started to get in touch with more pro players as well and I just uh, started to play more and more and that's where I got really better and that's where I sort of entered the international circuit where people outside of the Netherlands would know me as well. He was becoming better and I think that's 99% just of his own uh, drive to become a better player. Uh, this whole teaching thing I think is was pretty overrated or or maybe not maybe he got something out of it but um, you know getting more good players in Netherlands had always been interesting for our own scene and for our chance to compete at ENC so I like to groom Dutchies uh, if possible or help them and introduce them to the scene. Four Kings for me was finding my place in life for the first time. 
that sounds big, and uh, and it is. Um, of course, I've had friends before in school or through childhood, and um, you sometimes you, you meet friends, and then sometimes you lose track of them, and uh, you're always doing other things. You meet each other at school, or you went to the same school before, and uh, I appreciated that. But none of them like were gaming as as I were, and. To meet a bunch of people who were very, very different in their own way, but who in some way complemented each other's character, uh, and everyone brought something new to the to the table. But on the bottom line, we all loved Warcraft 3, and we had this team who, which could compete in the world, not because we were individually the best player, but we had great team spirit. Um, and every time we played a clan war, we did, wanted to win not only for ourselves, but for the whole team. And this made everyone play stronger. And the LAN events where we could gather up as, as a team and have fun before and have fun after and during the tournament, those were, for me, the most fun tournaments of all. And if I was playing solo tournaments, I would always do better if there was some other Four Kings player who also qualified or got invited or went there, just because uh, doing something while you're having a lot of fun makes you do it better. And so, and a little tip from them could help me feel confident, even if it wasn't a tip, maybe it's just a placebo effect. But I always thought that if I could talk to them a little before the match, Zeus or Fury or Todd or uh, Fall of Creo and also before Lon, Kai, Kiko, uh, that would uh, help. So for me, Four Kings was kind of like a, a homecoming. Okay, here. See you at the finals. <laughs> yeah, I think for us, uh, the performance on WC3L stood or fell with having a bootcamp or not. And moreover, it was also just this uh, really fun thing. I mean, we wanted it to happen for the fun uh, bootcamp. But it's hard to get a bootcamp for someone from France, someone from Croatia, Sweden and Netherlands and then probably a manager from Germany to get that all together to find a week of time and to find a location. But if we did, we had a great time and we performed the stars uh, out of the heaven at the tournament, I think, because it just created this uh, to togetherness feeling where everyone wants to win uh, for the team. When Creo joined, one of the main reasons was because he's joining a high-profile team with very good players in it, and he was also very excited to be playing in the same team as Fav. Unfortunately for him, Fav soon left the team because of not getting salary from Forkings. Uh, but that made it so that we had a European squad. And Creo, I mean, anyone now will try to be on the Creo boat to say that they always believed in him and that he's such a good player and he's a legend and stuff. Um, either they change their opinion or it's like the people who were criticizing keep quiet now but there were a lot of people criticizing Creo in the start when he joined for Kings and he had it very difficult with that there was a choice between Satini and, and Creo well, both are and were very good players but uh, in the end we chose Creo which everyone said was a huge mistake and we should have gone for Satini uh, Creo subsequently lost his first six or more or around their matches for Four Kings, but we never stopped believing in him. We just know that he's probably too nervous or something, or uh, just anything, he just needs to get his uh, groove on. And is it, is it difficult adjusting to this atmosphere? I mean, you have now Todd and Grubby in your team. Is it difficult to match these kind of guys, I mean, in, in Four Kings? Or uh, what kind of difference is it from Fnatic, your whole team then? Uh, I guess the main difference is that uh, everyone expects you to win every match. And uh, in Fnatic it was like, you could have a bad day and uh, it still was okay, but in 4K you are expected to do, expected to do really good. And uh, that's the main difference, I guess. But, uh, and does this kind of pushing all also give you more, give you more strength and I mean, makes you better? Yeah, uh, because you, you will always try to win, of course, but uh, in, in 4K it's more serious, so to say, that you are thinking a lot more about losses and uh, not only gaming wise but also circumstances around it like getting the right food or sleep or 
all those things and setting up. Prodigious came some point where he got over it and he started winning and become this really valuable player of the team points-wise because he was already a valuable player of the team right from the start. And I think he ended up playing about 13 months for us until, um, until he decided to call it quits because that's what he said. He said, I'm going to do this for one year, just like me. But unlike me, he said, okay, I've done it for one year now, I'm going to quit. And I think that's a decision that many pe people didn't get. Uh, I think I got it because Creo, more so than anyone I know, if he says he's going to do something, he will. He's extremely disciplined, extremely hardworking, and he knows exactly what he wants. And he wanted to do this, he's happy with what he's done. He's got this great memory now. He left in a way that probably no one else will ever leave the scene. Winning WCG, uh, coming from a year winning BlizzCon, uh, just doing extremely well, and then actually having the guts to call it quits. I would never do that. I think that he could have done a lot more also, but this is a choice that he makes, and you know, in the end you have to support that. the reason that Four Kings perished in the end. I don't know all the details because I'm not the manager, but um, I think we had a great sponsorship from Intel with probably enough to provide for all the teams, but something was probably going on and uh, we, were, we were very patient and very, very loyal. If anyone ever asked me if they remember if they tried to take me away from four kings hire me for their own team uh, i always used to answer never i will never leave four kings and it's kind of true because i never did until until it died uh, we were we were very loyal and we kept that loyalty even when the paycheck would be a bit late you know we didn't uh, we didn't play for the salary we just needed it to justify doing what we love but over time, you don't get it for a few months and you're like, okay, what's going on? Uh, and then usually it would be all right. But then at the end, it was never going to be all right again. And some people had a few months debt and some people had many months debt. I myself had very many months not being paid. And you know, there comes a point where you just say, okay, friendship with management, uh, it stops here. I won't keep doing this for nothing because this is kind of like, yeah, kind of like betrayal and very sad that this is happening. So I, we pretty much had no choice except to close the doors on the team. Well, I, I, I mean, we, we saw it coming, I guess. Fury didn't want to accept it. Uh, he, he, I mean, he couldn't believe it. I, I saw it coming for a few months um, because we weren't getting paid anymore. At least I wasn't. Um, we were getting very little to no communication with the management. We were not able to hire new players. I mean, Bill DC, he never got paid, even though it was promised. He was in our clan for months, really sad because also I invited him myself, so I felt personally responsible for that shit. Um, everything was going to shit. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt really bad because it was the, the end of, the inevitable end of something that we, we built up and we stayed loyal for so long and something died inside of me at, at that time. And I wasn't ready to leave the scene, but I didn't know how to continue. And I think it was at this point that I have three brothers, two of them are gaming brothers, one isn't, the oldest one, Yorit. It was at that point that he offered me a support, like moral support, which proved to be very valuable for me because he said, you know, sometimes you're so into something, it looks like it's the only thing and it looks like it's the best thing. But uh, when you have so much troubles, as I said we had, uh, you will find in time that if you look for something else, it can only be better, it can only be better. 
and it w so I finally accepted the possibility. Okay, maybe maybe I should find something else, and that meant having to say to my teammates, you know, this this isn't working anymore. Uh, we all have to find our own way, and if can, if we can, let's stick together. But what team is hiring like five, six people? So uh, I trusted in in Yorit, and uh, yeah, I found a new team, which, as he said, was a lot better than what we had. Yeah, sometimes friends are friends just for the occasion. Sometimes they're friends just because at that time you're you're doing the same thing. And in, in some cases it's like that. In other cases you find you have a lot more in common and those people you will keep talking to no matter what you do in your life. Um, or you know that if you don't talk to them for a very long time, you can meet up sometime again and you'll still connect in a really good way. Fury, I, I mean, I wish we lived in the same country or something. I still think he's, he's a very good, I consider him a very good friend and I know that it's mutual. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much chance to meet up anymore, but if any time I go to Sweden or Netherlands, or he goes to Netherlands, I think we'll have a good connection. Fof, he's still playing, so uh, you know he's, he's still a very good friend. Um, again, he's from South Korea, we don't meet up a lot anymore, and there's always, in some part, the language barrier and the culture difference, but he's a good guy, and uh, also I'm friends with him. Uh, Zeus, he kind of vanished. Also, I must admit, I never really got over the ESWC thing, and Todd, he's still playing, but also don't talk to him that much. Uh, but we have a normal professional relationship. Well, at some point, other teams started realizing that even though I was still in Four Kings, Four Kings was having some troubles, and they, as well as me, could see it coming. So they started uh, throwing their uh, their feelers out to to see whether I couldn't be persuaded to play for that team. Um, at that time, I wasn't saying anymore over my dead body. So I was more approachable and I just wanted to see what are the possibilities because I had been out of the market for a very long time, like, I mean, unavailable for others. Ari Wechter from MIM, he was also speaking Dutch and I think he was Dutch. He came through Netherlands at that time. We had a meeting, didn't intend to finalize anything, but by the end of the evening, I had uh, like a very good feeling. They were giving me uh, like a good feeling of the possibilities that we had. Uh, I was again gonna play in a team where pretty much everyone was as good as me or better. Um, for example, Moon was there, uh, Focus and Shy. Uh, you know, I was asking, is Moon gonna stay? And they said, well, we're not sure, uh, but pretty much yes. And I think probably he said that because I wanted to hear that too. <laughs> Art of negotiation. So, uh, then later I heard Moon is gonna leave. Then most people probably know what happened. He couldn't leave, so he stayed. Uh, I thought it was nice because I got to play uh, in the same team as him and just you know get to observe him, how he prepares practice and try to learn from him. So I got to play in a team with like a very strong team. And I think I brought Min to the first WC3L victory too, together. And that's also because we had a few days of bootcamp together. Well, you know, I have had one year with MYM uh, under ES Nation, and I have to say it's it's really unusual for a team to keep all or nearly all of their promises that they make to you. You read every day about teams which get started up, then they fault or they didn't keep their promise. And I mean, I had it in Four Kings many times, like financial problems, uh, banks not working, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, meteor makers, they always paid on time, they always paid uh, the, 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 the salary, they were never, well they were pretty much like never late and they didn't say like, oh yeah, now you're, now you're kicked, uh, just like that. I had a one year contract and they honored it, which I think uh, is pretty rare. <laughs> I, uh, probably. Some of the other big organizations are also doing everything by uh, properly, but I mean, I've only been in a few teams, and I think that, uh, like, team-wise, management-wise, 
we had a very large group of uh, managers. We had uh, Luzman and Nordahl who you just tell all your problems to and then they pass it to the right people. That was the way it had to be. Uh, and then we had like a lot of higher ups who, yeah, I hope were running the company well. And um, yeah, we had a lot of different teams. So suddenly we were part of this big organization. Everything was more professional. We got the shirts and the equipment uh, sent in a few days always. So it was again a step more professional than Four Kings was. Four Kings was a step more professional than ESO.nl was. Every time going more like in the right direction of it's becoming a real job where not only the management is just someone who loves the scene and stuff, but also tries to make a profit. Because in the end, a team will not exist for very long unless they are making a profit or at least trying to make a profit in the future and just trying to do, uh, handle everything as professionally as possible. And I think that was one step forward with uh, MIM in the first place. had a meeting with uh, with Mark uh, to discuss a new contract and then instead of coming by that day he called and said we're fired but it was quite it was in a way quite shocking but also in a way it was uh, not 100% surprise I mean we've had we've gone through the same thing with four kings and we can recognize a bit when things are looking to be not quite ideal so when that happened, we were like, oh, this is really disappointing and sad. And what are we going to do now? And we weren't sure. But also, it, yeah, I wouldn't say that we were 100% sure. Mostly it was trying to choose between, okay, am I gonna say goodbye to this world? But I think there was a thousand people telling me not to. Um, maybe in a way my heart was also telling me not to. That, that's one. Uh, I could also join another team, go solo, or something else. Something maybe esports related, but not necessarily as a player. Uh, I think Playing the game was just still, uh, and trying to be good or the best, was just still too important to me. So I think, yeah, I mean, I went with the choice of joining a team again. large part of 2007 I was having troubles thinking when is when am I getting paid and uh, I'm gonna be honest here now and I'm gonna uh, ask you to cut it out if I change my mind later but I didn't get paid since March in 2007 and I stayed until January next year and I think that's a very long time for for someone to stay loyal I mean I had the best hopes I wanted everything to be okay but uh, you know, they should have told me before that, you know, go find something else. But it, it was giving me a lot of headache. And uh, it's hard to focus sometimes on just competing because as an athlete, as a top sports person or, you know, a top performer, you need to make your mind empty. And that's a skill you can have. And it's easier if it's already empty, like if you really have nothing to worry about, and it's harder if you have a lot to worry about. And sometimes you can handle it better than at other times. So I would say partly it's that there was a lot to worry about, and partly also that maybe I couldn't handle it well enough, because I mean, I have stuff to worry about now too, but I think I got better at it, at, at separating it, um, the real life issues or those issues from performance. But yeah, it was difficult in 2007 sometimes.
I was going to a tournament in Singapore, the World Cyber Games 2005, and I, as I remember it from my side, you can ask her side later, I went to the tournament, lost, uh, then there was the, the after party. And you know, after party is always like 95% guys, but for me that's fine. I mean, I had never really like been on the lookout for someone. I just thought if it happens, it happens. And then suddenly, in the darkness, because you know, as a gamer, there is a lot of darkness, dark rooms and unlit areas. Uh, there was this, you know, halo of light uh, from the camera. You know, those lights were there, and in the middle was uh, standing this uh, well, someone who I thought was, at first sight, very nice to look at. <laughs> we walked past her, and she actually uh, talked to me. And I remember one of the first things I said is like, "Why would a beautiful girl like you want to talk to a guy like me?" <laughs> Something which I really felt. And she just said, are you grubby? And I was like, oh yeah. Uh, and then she asked, can I have your signature? And I didn't even go to the event at all because uh, I couldn't make it, but I heard stories from my friends and they were like, oh, I, I saw grubby at the event, um, but too bad uh, we couldn't get near to the players. And we asked him for signature, but he's so arrogant. He said no. <laughs> And then I'm like, oh, really? That's scary. <laughs> you know, then I wanted, I wanted to meet him. I don't know whether he'll be there, so I took my chance. And, yeah, okay, I'll go. And when I was there, uh, I saw him. Uh, then, yeah, this famous face, but I didn't know what I should do. So I just approached him like a normal fan. <laughs> like, hi, are you grubby? You know, can I have uh, your signature? I brought my Warcraft CD so he could sign. And I still have it. Um, yeah. Okay, during WCG, I had a very unapproachable attitude in general. And I was pretty much saying no to everything because I thought, this is my tournament. I've got uh, 20 tournaments in a year and I'll try to give signatures and photos and everything. But this tournament, I, I felt very strong pressure on myself. Uh, I was saying no to everything. And I thought, now is a choice. I can either be a man of principles even when a beautiful girl comes and talks to you uh, and asks you, can I have your MSN and your signature? You still say no, then you're really a strong person and you'll stick to your principles. Or you cannot be a retard and, uh, you know. So, well, we talked a little bit. I gave her, we, get, we exchanged contacts. And then uh, some other guys talked to her and well, I'm not really used to fighting over the attention of girls, so I just, took my chance and I left and then when she looked around I was gone and then I stayed at the players party there a bit and uh, yeah, next day we went home uh, later that day in Singapore. Yeah and I wanted to talk to him more but I was working and uh, there was there was a lot going on so yeah so then we missed each other uh, and later on I couldn't see him around anymore because uh, his, he told me that he was drunk, you know, like uh, he was lying somewhere, right? I wasn't one of the people that was sitting up, but I was lying down on the couch. I wasn't drunk, but I had a very bad hangover, so I was kind of hidden among people trying to sleep. Well, after that, we, you know, I got back to Netherlands and I, we added each other to MSN, but I think it took like one or two weeks. Then we just talked a little and I started realizing, well, I probably made like a pretty stupid mistake by, because it seems like she was very nice also, like a uh, very nice person and it seems like she would have wanted the chance to talk more. And I guess I would have too, but except that probably I was too, uh, too shy. So we talked for a few months and it was pretty nice and eventually Life's caught up again and uh, probably we, she or me went on a trip and we didn't talk to each other for a while. And then through Gigi Klein actually, we were both watching this game and we were in the room and we were like, hey you, you know. And, and we just 
we're talking on GGC and well, I have to say it's not really the most beautiful chat program but it's, it's just about the occasion and the spontaneousness. We talked and, and, and like never before I think we really hit it off and we realized how much we have in common and what really helped is that we met each other before so we know the other is not some uh, fat hairy old poser guy uh, but uh, we knew we both existed. And then we, we saw, we met each other and we started talking and I talked with him like nearly the whole night, uh, a few hours I believe. Uh, then when I got to know him better uh, throughout the, the next few months, I, I was like, wow, we had such a connection, you know, we are so similar in, in so many ways. She thought I was really sweet, intelligent, <laughs> and so, <laughs> <laughs> so you could kind of call it like uh, getting together through the internet, but not quite. And then we, we just both got interested uh, in, in, in spending some time together, if possible, to see you know, uh, what this could be, because the distance was pretty big between Singapore and Netherlands. And I have to admit, at first thought, I thought even if we like each other, uh, maybe it's not realistic because how do you overcome such distance? But uh, this one is a tenacious one. I mean, she doesn't take no for an answer any, any time. So uh, in the end, we were looking at maybe we can take a holiday by the end of the year. The end of the year was still quite far away, especially when you're starting to fall in love with someone. So. We both didn't want to wait that long and an opportunity came that when I'm in the neighborhood, neighborhood, China, only six hours away from Singapore, uh, we could meet up. I mean, it's still better than traveling 12 to 14 hours. Uh, I think it was in uh, July, August, I was in the uh, Philippines uh, and then I, I, because I was alone in a strange country and it's not safe to go out alone in the Philippines. Um, so at night, I, I usually uh, stay in the hotel, uh, I have nothing to do, so I'm always online. Uh, we talk a lot and, and we found out that there's this event uh, in China, Beijing, there was a uh, Code 5 uh, coming up in September. Then we were like, hey, uh, China, uh, I can go there, it's in Asia, right? Uh, I didn't know how far away it was. I thought like maybe four hours flight or something, but it was like six hours flight from Singapore. So, oh, we, we agreed that we, we could meet up uh, during the event and maybe uh, after the event we take a few more days, we stay a few more days there uh, just to, to go sightseeing together, visit the Great Wall of China. And that was my first time to China. She was taking a, a plane earlier than me to go to China, so she was already there the night before. And so I was coming to meet her from the airport in a taxi. And when I was in the taxi, I was still completely in the mood of solo travel. When uh, he was uh, in a taxi, at all, when he, he just reached the airport, you know, when, when he touched down, I was like uh, still sleeping <laughs> because I slept really late the, the night before. So when I received his phone call, I was like, oh shit. And then I pick up the phone and then he said, yeah, uh, I'm coming, uh, I'm, I'm coming from the airport. Then I had to get really ready really fast. And, and then I was waiting uh, downstairs for him. But his taxi lost, lost his way yeah. or something. Yeah. And so you were waiting for like an hour. <laughs> and I was just standing there like, uh, when is he coming? I tried not to think about it because I would probably get way too nervous and ask the taxi to go back and I'll fly home again. Uh, no, but then as soon as I arrived with the taxi there, she was standing. And you have to remember, we did meet before. So it's not like we never met her. Uh, I never met her. And uh, it was kind of like a weird first meeting. Um, I'm not that smooth, I would say. So I, I mean, I always need a little bit of time to break the ice with someone I haven't seen for a long time or ever. Well, after Code 5, where I think we really found out that not only through MSN uh, our relationship seems to be very nice, 
because that would have been hard then we would even in real life we would only be able to talk through laptops with each other but uh, we actually really like to talk to each other in uh, real life too and uh, yeah I would say from that point onwards we we tried to do everything we could to meet up more we were in Korea together. After that, I was in Korea for a few weeks. I had Maybe three uh, weeks. Yeah, three weeks. And uh, after that... Actually, in Korea, uh, I was supposed to go back home after two weeks, but uh, he made me stay for another week, <laughs> and I had to cancel my, my assignments, yeah. uh, which was really bad. You know, like, my agency was kind of mad at me. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing that we really that w one way we really grew up separately from each other before we met, which has also led to us being very compatible, is that we went through a life where we don't take anything for granted, we think freely, and we are open to the future in a way that we don't need to know what we are doing in five years. And we are willing to embark on this mission, quest, journey, uh, together, wherever it takes us, as as long as uh, we can do it together, then yeah, I guess we're not afraid of anything. <laughs> no, I think we are a good team.